to give special thanks today to everyone who has worked so hard uh, to advertise this and uh, prepare all of the visuals and all of the technology and everything that's going on. I had an experience this spring that was very unique. Um, it wasn't anything that I had to do with, but I got involved in the situation. On April 2nd, a letter was compiled and sent to several residents in Winchester Hills, which is six and a half miles north of the last stoplight on Bluff Street heading out of St. George. This was the letter that we received. Uh, it was sent by certified mail, and it cost them about $14 to mail each letter to the individuals that were involved. Forty-five of us got these letters. Um, basically, what happened was in the early 1950s, uh, the Utah National Guard conducted training maneuvers in the area where I now reside. Seven, eight, eight years ago, in 2007, a gentleman was out hiking around the area behind our homes and found a, an unexploded missile. It was a 3.5 inch bazooka round and it was unexploded. He tossed it in the back of his truck drove down to the sheriff's department, they got all excited about it, took it out into the fields and detonated it. That was eight years ago. So on April 2nd, they wrote a letter and told us that because of that bazooka shell was found and because the Utah National Guard had used that territory for training, military training, we were going to be evacuated from our homes and taken to an evacuation center so that a, a search could be conducted for munitions that would be lying around there. Well, we've, I've, I personally have lived there for 22 years. I was not a newcomer to the area. There have been people there for 40 years tilling, bulldozing, horseback riding, dirt biking, hiking, everything, and no one has been injured, but all of a sudden now in 2015, it's an emergency that we evacuate 45 people from their homes and do this search. So we got this letter, and in the letter, uh, can you scroll it up, Corey? It tells us that uh, we will not be allowed to stay in our homes. We will be taken to an evacuation center and uh, we will not be allowed on our streets, on our sidewalks, on our lawns, in any other common area around the residences. And uh, they will schedule, they, they were gonna tell us what, next, page two now, Corey, they're gonna schedule this, and if we happen to be out of town, we're to let them know where we're going to be, and um, we are not to have any appointments, we're not to have anybody come up to our home to do anything, we are to be gone from our home. Well, they neglected to realize that they were talking about uh, personal private property rights here and that they had no jurisdiction over us. So I sent an email to Robert and uh, asked him what to do about this. I also contacted Washington County Sheriff and said that I felt that my rights were being violated. And uh, in the letter, we are told that they're gonna, they're, we're going to have a meeting where we can come and discuss all of this. And uh, in addition to taking good care of us while they're doing the search, they will take care of our pets, our animals, they'll take care of the, any elderly with special needs, they'll take care of uh, handicapped people. They're gonna take care of all of us and take us to an evacuation center. Doesn't that sound great? To have the government come in and take care of you while you're away from your home and your property, who knows what they're going to be doing in your property while you're gone and not be able to see. So they sent us an information sheet telling us all about this and um, what, what they found. Um, they told us that they were, at this meeting, we could come and ask questions. Well, I started talking to my neighbors and telling them what the potential was here and that they were violating the Constitution and they had no right to do this. And so we all showed up. A lot of us showed up at the meeting, and I was very pleased about that, that the citizens were going to come out and uh, resist this government intrusion into our private lives. Um, but, I, but I was very sad when I heard about the comments of my neighbors. Well, my daughter is planning to come and visit. What will you do about my daughter? And I have this little problem that I need to take care of. And what about my kittens? And what will, and no one, well, ex, none of them, none of my neighbors, uh, bothered to address the concerns about their liberties and freedoms which were being stripped from them. So I had the sheriff uh, there, he was present, and, and some of my other neighbors who weren't involved in the evacuation came who are quite vocal politically, and we told them that we were not leaving our homes, they were not going to evacuate us, it was our personal property, and we were staying there. 
So, we then got a follow-up letter on April 29th. And this letter basically says, uh, we have scheduled a location for you to go. You can go there from 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. And now we will bring, be bringing lunch for you to go to this evacuation center. And if you have a hard time getting there, we will provide transportation to get you to the evacuation center. So everything that was agreed upon at the meeting, it was agreed that we could stay in our homes if we were going to be 535 feet uh, to a piece of munition that they might find that we would then at that point be asked if we would like to evacuate, but it was our choice to stay while they detonated the munition at that point in time. So everything that we had agreed on was then nullified in this letter, and we were going back to the evacuation center and with lunch this time, another incentive given to us. So they told us that uh, door hangers would come around. This is a door hanger. I know it's missing the little circle. It's because my husband ripped it off the door and, <laughs> and told us when we were to be out of our homes and that we, as we departed our homes, they would be collecting our uh, information so that they could contact us and let us know when it was safe to come into our homes again. At both ends of the street, where they do in the evacuation, they put up big signs that said, evacuation, you are to be out of your home at 8 a.m. We'll call you when it's free to it's free to come back. Now, in this letter, I want you to see what they sent. This is a list of all the residences involved. They sent map after map after map of the area, uh, all at your expense. You guys paid for this. It was so nice of you to pay for all these maps and all this information that we got from the United States government. So, uh, the morning came, the Monday morning came when we were to be evacuated, and um, I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> So pretty soon there was a knock on my door and said, uh, Mrs. Judd, it's time for you to leave. And I said, I'm not leaving. And he said, well, then stay in your house. And uh, I didn't. I went, up and put, I went outside and put up my flag. I went outside and got my ladder because I was cleaning my plant shelves that day. And I went outside and took a soda to the sheriff and the three deputies, four trucks, who were there in front of my house to assure me that my constitutional rights would not be violated. Um, and and <laughs> I very sadly watched my entire street evacuate. It, it broke my heart that every one of them got in their vehicles and headed down to the evacuation center. I went out in the street and I said, you do not have to leave. This is in violation of your constitutional rights. They have no jurisdiction here. They have no authority. The sheriff and his three deputies are here to see that we can stay in our homes. And they said, well, we're going. Free lunch, swimming pool, you know, we're going to go. So off they went. I spent the day alone uh, in Winchester Hills, um, went out and gave soda to the sheriff's uh, uh, people frequently. What did I learn? <laughs> I learned that my neighbors are sheep and that they will follow. I learned that uh, I have a sheriff in Washington County who will stand up for my constitutional rights. And if I feel that they are being violated, I simply need to contact him and he will bring his deputies up and see that I do, I'm not, my constitutional rights are not taken from me. There was a lot of excitement about this, thinking it, it was in connection with Jade Helm. I trust that you, people who are here in this audience today, understand what Jade Helm is. Uh, it's going to take place from July 15th to September 15th this year. If you haven't heard about it yet, you will hear about it. It's on the news a lot. Um, I, I think, and I might be dead wrong, and if I am, I'll apologize for that. I think that they were testing the water that they found a reason to see what it would take to get us to evacuate from our homes. I believe that the TSA has successfully taught the American citizens how to stand in line, how to empty their pockets, take off their belts, take off their shoes, watch their stuff go, go behind a curtain, and march on down the aisle. We now know how to stand in line, America. Congratulations. I believe that they were testing us in Winchester Hills to see how easy it would be to get us to an evacuation center. They were successful. 
One couple in their 90s said they couldn't go because they didn't drive and they, are, and they provided transportation to the evacuation center. I went out into the street and pleaded with my neighbors to stay in their homes and they didn't, they left. Um, and they got their free lunch and it was all good. <laughs> so if you want free lunch, you can do that. But I believe in the end, bottom line, you need to work with your sheriff so that you, you know what your rights are and you stand firm. And uh, number two, I believe they were testing the water to see what was going to happen with the Jane Helm experience. I've often wondered what I would do if I were asked to load up in a railroad car. I now know. I also know what my neighbors will do. I'm not going. You may go if you like. I will call upon my sheriff and I will stand my ground. And I was, I was ready to be called to jail against my wishes, um, but it didn't happen. My sheriff was there to protect me. So make friends with your sheriff and teach him all about the Constitution. All right. Um, this is what I really want to talk about today. I did that as a favor to, for, to, Will, or to, to uh, Wayne, who asked me to do that. Today I would like to talk about how we can spiritually protect our families in the upcoming approach of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Um, the Jews two millennia ago did not believe that their city and especially their temple could be destroyed. And because of that, they wrote, revolted against Rome in 66 AD. And Rome simply surrounded Jerusalem and waited for them to destroy themselves from within. They did not have to wait very long. The destruction came. For those who heeded the promptings of the prophets and followed the direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit, when the hour came, they fled to the mountains, and those few were saved. For those who were arrogant, self-made men, and thought that they knew better than the prophets, they lost their lives. It is estimated that 1,100,000 Jewish males were murdered and that 98,000 were taken into captivity at that time. For those who were murdered, uh, 600,000 of them were impaled on crosses lining the streets and roads of Jerusalem. For those who were captured, many of them were uh, given to the gladiators, and they lost their life in that way. Others were put in the mines where their health was destroyed, and they eventually lost their lives that way. So our decision to believe and to have faith in Jesus Christ affects all other decisions that we will make. If you do not believe that there is spiritual preparation information provided in God's book, then you do not believe in God's book because it is there. I was appreciative that um, Wayne asked me to speak on, on this topic, topic during um, my study of the New Testament this year. Because I watched what Christ did, I watched what he said, I listened to his parables, and I discovered uh, that within that book is not an uh, answer to how we um, uh, prepare um, for, to protect, to, um, okay, I've lost my thought. In that book is a recipe of how to prepare spiritually for the upcoming great and dreadful day of the Lord. Joseph Stalin, many years ago, said this, America is like a healthy body, and its resistance is threefold. Number one, they resist patriotically. Number two, they re re resist in morality. And number three, they resist in their spiritual life. Americans, how are we doing with that resistance? Stalin went on to say, if we can undermine these three areas, America will collapse from within. I believe that as we look at patriotism, morality, and our spiritual life, America is collapsing. I have two soda pop cans here. One is empty. It has not been prepared spiritually. Salt of the earth has not been put in. Uh, church attendance is not in there. Other, other spiritual preparation has not been added to this can. And so when 
ad the adversary comes after us, the col can collapses very easily. And the other can has been filled with spiritual pr preparation, service to our fellow men, attendance at church, reading God's book. And because of this, I cannot collapse the walls of the can because it is filled with spiritual preparation which we need to face the future. As I uh, study God's book, I learned some very interesting things early on. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, I learned that God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. The next verse tells me that Adam was advised to multiply and replenish the earth. The admonition was repeated again to Noah in Genesis chapter 9 to multiply and replenish the earth. And then in chapter 2 of Genesis verse 24, the admonition is to leave your father and mother and cleave unto each other so that you can multiply and replenish the earth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11, we learn that neither is the man without the woman, nor the woman without the man in the Lord. So the other day, as I was preparing for this, I asked my husband, do we have anything around the house that have male and female parts? And he just loved to go on this scavenger hunt for me. So he came back with a few items. One of them was this. One part is the female part, and one part is the male part. When you put them together, they do a job for you, right? Okay, now can the same job be done if we had two of these or two of these? Doesn't work so well, does it? This, he tells me, is a coupling for a garden hose, okay? A female part and a male part. They work like this. You just twist them together and then you get your job done. If I use two of this part, will I get my job done? How about two of this part? Will it work for me? They have to work together to be successful. This is my personal favorite. <laughs> I have a gadget here that has a male part and a female part. Will this provide electricity for me if I have two of these? Will I get re electricity if I have two of these? Okay, well, will I get to hear my iPod and my cell phone and my other things if I, if, I have, if I do this? So it takes the male and the female part working together to get the job done. Our Father in Heaven knew that. He planned that. He provided families for us so that we could get his job done. We cannot get his job done with all females. We can't get his work done if we are all males. It requires both of us, fitting parts. Both father and mother are very important. Um, the scriptures, significant, are a record of families. They start with the story of a family, and it continues throughout them. We also have stories in God's book that tell us that the consequences that come when we are anti-family. And I'm sure you're all familiar with what happened to those of Sodom and Gomorrah when they were behaving in anti-family ways. By the way, do, do you, um, I, I, I'm going to promise you guys some rewards today if you will do what I ask you to do. I promise I have a reward for if you if you'll just do the things I ask you to do. Um, and, okay, I'll, I'll get with that in a minute. A, a gentleman I, that I love very dearly by the name of L. Tom Perry, in his last address, his last public address before his death, said, a committed marriage and family lifestyle is the most sensible, the most economical, and the happiest way to live. No one has come up with a more efficient way to raise the next generation than a household of married parents with children. You have a better plan? That was God's plan. Now, there are a lot of things I'm, going to, I'm just going to ask you today in your mind. Answer the question to yourself. Can you fix the Federal Reserve? Can you fix the Federal Reserve? Right? 
can you uh, slow down the cancerous growth of an over bloated government you, by yourself? Can you do that? Can you pay off the national debt by yourself? How about can you live within a budget in your family? Can you do that? All right. Can you stop the onslaught of pornography in this country? But can you refuse to participate in the purchase of pornography? Can you uh, stop people or the government in their craziness, their ways of doing things? But can you teach your family how to do things well and have a successful family, as Bill has just told us about today? And how did you do in stopping Obamacare this past week? And what did you accomplish with the Defense of Marriage Act this week? How did you do with that? in changing that situation. We have a very inefficient educational system in the country today. And the reason why we have that is because parents have abdicated their responsibility to be their t children's teachers. If we had held on to that responsibility, we might not be suffering with the educational system that we have. And um, what about our vast network of, uh, of uh, Entitlement programs. Too many of us are too lazy to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty and take care of the charity work in our communities. We would rather turn it over to the government. And that's why we have a bloated government. Leo Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing themselves. What if we were to change ourselves? Would the world be different? Would we impact those who view our lives? And Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. Do you have control over the Federal Reserve? Over the national debt? Who do you have control over? I only have control over one person. And I do what I can with that control. I, I, I'm, I'm always amazed when I get these emails that say, Pass this on to 20 people. <laughs> well, I don't. But what I do is I put a re return, I push the return button, and I write to the person that sent it to me, please offer, a, please offer a solution for the problem. Tell me what you are going to do and what you want us to do, and then I will forward it. For six, and, six or seven years I've been doing that, and so far no one has offered me a solution. They want to talk about the problem, but they don't want to provide a solution. All right, I have a bag of M&Ms here. There are a few children in the audience. I need some help. Could I get the children to come and sit up on these chairs real quickly? It's OK to move quickly. I have a bag of M&Ms here. I would like to know how many M&Ms you believe are in the bag. And just shout out a number. Thank you very much. OK, now, for the rest of you, if you've got a notebook, notebook or your gadget, sit down on these chairs right here. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. OK, so write down a number. And I promise I have a prize for the person who has the right number, OK? All right, how many colors do you think, how many different colors do you think are in my bag of M&Ms? Thank you. And how many do you think are? Oh, oh, first, what colors do you think are in my bag of M&Ms? Okay. Okay, good. All right, now I want you to write down on your paper how many different colors, how many different colors, how many browns are in the bag, how many yellows are in the bag, how many reds are in the bag, how many blues are in the bag, how many oranges, how many...
Now, Robert, as soon as you have the answer to that, would you please let me know? Now, is there any way for us to know how many M&Ms are in the bag without opening the bag? Okay, so we have to open the bag, as Robert is doing here, before we can know how many M&Ms there are and how many different colors there are. So Robert's got the bag open. He's doing that for us, and he's going to let us, let us know what goes on. And for those of you who guessed the right numbers, I have a reward for you. Don't forget that. All right. Um, God does not teach us how to overcome mortal challenges in the moral, mortal, mortal challenges of mortality in his book, nor, does he, nor did Jesus Christ teach us how to overcome the government oppression of his day. You can't find a scripture in any of the four gospels that will give that information. What does he teach us in the four gospels? As, that is correct. And by bettering ourselves, will we be prepared for the great and dreadful day of the Lord? Okay, and that's what we're trying to find out today, how to do that uh, particular thing. All right, so when we focus on the right things, we can accomplish what it is that God wants us to accomplish. When the kid's playing soccer, it's always interesting to me that when they're ready to kick that ball to the goal, they're, they're focused on the goalie. And where does the ball land? In the goalie's hands. They've got 20 feet on one side and 20 feet on another side, but they're focusing on the goalie, and that's where the ball goes. We have got to learn to focus on the right thing, and focusing on God's word is the right thing to do. For you, those of you who are horse riders, you will know that when, you, when your focus changes, your horse follows your focus. As a leader, you can make that happen. <clears throat> now... Robert, how are we doing over there? <laughs> um, the whole purpose of this object lesson is to help us to understand without opening God's word, we cannot know what is in it. I have been grateful for the opportunity to open the four Gospels this year and take a look at what Jesus Christ said about spiritual preparation. I would really love to hear from you today and what you're doing with regards to spiritual preparation in connection with what God's words in the, in the four Gospels, Jesus Christ's word in the four Gospels. Prepare through that example. What one thing did he lack? Okay, so he was unwilling to let go of his money. How, why do we need to be willing to let go of our money to be spiritually prepared? Exactly. And that was what the Jewish people were lacking. They didn't hear the voice of the Spirit, and consequently they were massacred. All right. Uh, how about uh, the parable of the talents? How does that help us be spiritually prepared? The parable of the talents. Okay. All right. The other is that if you do not multiply your own wealth or your own ability, you will not be able to help others when the opportunity arises. Exactly. Thank you very much. All right. How about the parable of the sheep and the goats? What do we learn from that in spiritual preparation? What did the sheep do? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what? Who were who were obedient? And who were disobedient? And what happens to them in the end? Okay, so does God keep his promises? Will the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrive? Did Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed? So in order to be prepared, 
we can be a sheep and be obedient, and to be unprepared, we can be a goat and not follow. Yes? A little louder. We need a little louder. And we have not learned how to listen to the Spirit or follow the promptings. We're, we're, going to be lot, we're going to have a lot of food storage, but we'll be inside the walls of Jerusalem. We will not have fled when it was time to flee. Jason. So the number one thing is faith. Okay. Because if we read in the parable of the mustard seed, it yes. states that we can move mountains. Exactly. Well, and Moses parted the Red Sea, but because, yeah, with his priesthood, but also because of faith. So just let that sink, sink in for a second. Any one of us can perform miracles, but we have to have the faith. Okay, thank you very much. Very important ingredient to add oil in our lamp. What about the parables of the lost coin, the prodigal son, and the good shepherd? What, is, what do those three parables bunched together teach us about spiritual preparation? Lost coin, prodigal son. What do we learn? Will. It's not working. Keep looking for the one that is lost and uh, not give up. Okay, so we, so we are to do missionary work, right? Um, a famous author, I can't remember who it says, says, always teach the gospel. Always teach the gospel, even if you have to use words. So that's part of going after those lost souls. All right. Um, what about the parable of the Good Samaritan? Yes. It teaches you to help those when you can. And why do we need to do, why is that spiritually preparing us? It spiritually prepares you because it, ha, be, you helping others allows, not only gives you a more charitable spirit, but it also shows others that you are willing to help them in times of me, need, okay. and that inspires them to seek out you in case you Perfect. need help. Okay, thank you very much. It's better to be a Samaritan than a priest and a Levite. And why is that? Piety. Okay, exactly. Oh, really? Five minutes? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to stop there then, and we're going to get down to this five-minute business. Um, which is not going to be pretty. Okay. Um, I have a friend whose last words were on his deathbed. How did we get mixed up in this mess? We have lost our strong Christian beliefs. Find a way to stay close to him. If we cannot stay close to him, there is not much hope. During worship time, ask yourself these four questions. Who am I? What am I doing? How am I living? What should I be accomplishing? Now, there's a substance in the redwood trees that prevents them from dying. They have fires all around them all the time. They get scarred and they get burned. But there's a substance called tannin in their bark which prevents them from perishing in the fires. So, what will you do to provide tannin for your family in these, in these scary times? Who was Michael Collins? Do you know Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong? He was the astronaut that was in the spaceship going behind the dark side of the moon when they were walking on the moon. And all communication was shut off to him. And he said when that first went off and everything was dark, he was very frightened. But... This is what he testified, and this is why we don't hear about Michael Collins. He testified that the Holy Spirit was there, giving him comfort and peace. Um, we will be protected when we learn to follow the prophets and the voice of the Holy Spirit, and if we do not do that, we will not be protected. Winston Churchill said this, 
To every man there comes that special moment when he is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered the chance to do something special, something unique that is fitted precisely to him. What a tragedy that that moment finds him unprepared and unqualified for the work that would be his finest hour. Ladies and gentlemen, we are it. Are we prepared? Have we qualified ourselves? It is up to us to save our families spiritually. No one else is going to do that. We have got them to, to teach them to heed the warnings. Now, our youth now are being raised in enemy territory. We are part of God's family. My heavenly father has a son. His son is named Jesus Christ. I am also a daughter of my heavenly father. That makes Jesus Christ my brother. We are members of the family of God. God has given us instructions to avoid the destruction which is ahead. By following those instructions, we will be safe. We can leave legacies behind or we can leave liabilities. We cannot keep a residence in Zion and in Babylon simultaneously. We must choose to stand with the Lord. Now, God does keep his promises. I promise you that the end will come and it will be unhappy for the goats and very happy for the sheep. Um, the sheep will be separated and we will be able to stand with them. Sean Reyes was speaking at a worldwide meeting a few weeks ago, well, recently, and uh, just as he was to go on stage to this worldwide audience, his mother called him on the phone. And he picked up the phone reluctantly, but he picked it up and listened to what she, the coaching that she had to give him at the last minute. That Easter weekend, which followed his worldwide address, his mother passed away unexpectedly. Had he not picked up the phone, he would have not heard his mother's last words. Ladies and gentlemen, families are the most important thing there is. We are part of God's family, and by being part of God's family. We can, set, we can be the light on the hill. We can be the salt of the earth. We can be what God wants us to be in order to be able to return to him. I suspect my time is over, but are you curious? How many green uh, M&Ms are there? Oh, hurry, count them. 10. How many orange ones are there? 17. How many blue ones are there? Hurry. How many? How many? 12. What color? Red, red 12, and yellow, and brown, and, oh, okay, she's still counting. Did we get a total, Robert? Okay, we don't have a, okay. Did any of you guess properly? Did any of you get close? Do we know how many beans, how many M&Ms there are? Okay, did, did anybody guess these colors? Because I have a prize for you that I promised. Did anybody guess? Okay, I'm done. Um, I want you to know that God keeps his promises. Um, I wish one of you had selected a number up here because I would have given you this prize. How many? 33. 33. Okay. Okay, thank you. Now, I have a prize because she's got 33. Okay, here's the prize. I've opened it for you because I knew you'd be slow doing that. This is your prize, Okay. I changed my mind. I'm going to keep the prize. Now, do men keep their promises? We have a nation of leaders who do not keep their promises to us. We cannot trust them, but we can trust God. I invite you to get in his book and stay in his book and be spiritually prepared so that you will be not lost on that great and dreadful day. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.